In this video, we're going to jump from the Vietnam War to Operation Iraqi Freedom. And I'm going to give you some information on EFPs, Explosively Formed Projectiles. I am not going to tell you how to make them. Okay, there are, there are videos on YouTube that do show how to make them. I am not going to do the links to them. They are a lot simpler than you think. When these first started getting encountered in Iraq, say about uh, mid-war, the media did a big propaganda thing, probably under a push from the uh, Pentagon to talk about how these were revolutionary, these were so sophisticated, you know, came out of nowhere, no one expected them. That's BS, okay? This is technology that has existed for decades. Uh, the British actually produced a landmine that was essentially an EFP. And the thought is that the idea for this came into Iraq from Iran or Iran because these were first encountered on the eastern part of the country near Iran, near areas where they were supporting particular groups of militants. Now, it's if you understand or learn about shape charges, you'll understand pretty easily how these went together and what they did. They're just a little bit different than a shape charge. So if you understand the principles on shape charges and high explosive anti-tank warheads, you'll understand this really easy for when you're trying to answer questions when people are asking you for reenactments or displays. Now first, see if I can get a good close up here. A little bit on what it is, what it does. Essentially an EFP is a metal container filled with explosives and you have a curved plate on the front. That curved plate was made out of copper or steel. It was even thickness all the way across the plate. This was typically initiated by an electric blasting cap from the back. So the signal would come through to the blasting cap, set off the explosive. The explosive would detonate, pushing out the plate from the end. As it's doing that, it's superheating the, the plate, causing it to deform into this big molten slug, which would hit the target. Now, the difference between the copper and the steel plates. The copper plates would melt their way through. The same way that the copper plate inside a high explosive anti-tank warhead does when it hits the armor. The steel plate does not get as molten by the time it hits the target. So what that does, it kind of pushes its way through. It shatters its way in, causing more spalling on the inside. The copper will cause molten spalling, molten fragments to get tossed through the vehicle. The steel plate will cause more of a sharp edged fragment to fly through the vehicle. I'm not going to tell you sizes and explosive weight and stuff like that. And I can tell you looking at some of the info that's on here, I don't really agree with that either. That looks like propaganda info. but. Uh, Over here is primarily what I'm going to talk to you about. This was late war. Multiple EFPs hooked into a PIR sensor, passive infrared sensor. The sensor they used, we were told, was the same type that's used inside your garage. Uh, some people have it where when they enter their garage, there is a passive infrared sensor connected to the lights. As soon as it detects the heat from the engine, it turns on the lights in the garage. And then when the engine cools down enough, the lights would turn off. So basically, someone, either the Saudis or the Iranians, would get a hold of these PIR sensors from these garage light sets, and they were sending them into Iraq, sending them to the facilities or uh, groups that were manufacturing the EFPs.
Now, before that point, the EFPs were command detonated. Someone had to be out there giving a signal either by remote or command detonation by hooking up the wires to a battery, hitting the uh, firing device, whatever it was. What this does is it put the EFP out there as a landmine, just waiting for the vehicle to come in front. As soon as that PIR sensor detected the heat from either the engine or off of the wheels or the tracks of a vehicle, it did what it was supposed to. Instead of turning on lights in a garage, it sent the signal to the blasting cap inside the EFP, setting off the EFP. Now, there, this was defeated fairly quickly, okay, doing these as individually with a single PIR sensor above. The, it was solved with what was called a rhino. The rhino, if you've, if you've ever seen a picture of an MRAP or Humvee in Iraq, or potentially in Afghanistan now too, of a black box on a piece of metal being held out in front of a vehicle, that's a rhino. That thing is designed, that box up there is designed to get hot to set off a PIR sensor. So what they would do, you'd put that on front of the coalition vehicles, they're driving along, that box would uh, be hot enough that it would set off that sensor, it would detonate the EFP before the vehicle got up there. Now it didn't take them long though to realize they needed to change tactics. That was a big thing with the insurgents in Iraq. They were constantly evolving. What they did one week was not necessarily what they did the next week or even the next day. They were constantly changing their tactics. And we were always reacting to it, finding ways to counter that tactic. So, one thing that they came up with was multiple EFPs. And I'll explain this here. And this scared the living hell out of coalition troops. So what I got here is my simulated little MRAP, okay? With the Rhino on the front. So what the Iraqis did, they, they would make multiple EFPs hooked into the PIR sensor. Usually one sensor is what I came across, but I'm sure they, after a while, they ended up doing a couple. But PIR sensors are not cheap. I know I looked them up once and I came across like 200 bucks for a single sensor. Just to see, get an idea of how much money was going into the construction of these. They would uh, create multiple EFPs, camouflage them inside a homemade rock. And as you've seen in the previous picture, it was surrounded by foam. They would use spray foam, create a, a rock type shape. They would sprinkle in sand, gravel, grit in there before the foam was fully hardened. Spray paint it a bit, try to camouflage it, make it look like a rock as much as possible. Something that would blend into the area. So what would happen? The vehicle with the rhino would come along. You had the sensor right here on the middle, typically, and it would fire. So it would send that one EFP going this way, but then you also had another one angled. That one would detonate at the same time, and that one was typically angled where it would hit the side of the vehicle. Now another one that I heard of, this worked if uh, they were expecting traffic coming from one direction. Now, something I had heard that was done, if it was in place next to a roadway, they didn't know which direction they were coming from, if they were coming from the right or the left, they would put it in a series of three. One in the center, one angled off to each side with the PIR sensor in the middle. So the same thing. Rhino would set off the sensor, that center EFP would take out the Rhino, and then one of those on the either side would hit the vehicle. Now, just to give you an idea on how damaging these were, EFPs are 
in and of themselves cheap to manufacture, but they could breach M1 Abrams tanks. They could breach M2 Bradleys even with the RPG caging and standoff caging on the sides. They can breach a striker. They can breach an MRAP. Uh, the only kills I am aware of that ever happened on a Husky Mark II or Mark III were done by an EFP. There might have been one that was done by a lucky shot from an RPG, but the only ones I'm aware of were done by EFPs. Huskies are mine detection vehicles. Uh, they, they looked essentially like a road grader with a uh, mine detector underneath instead of a... Uh, instead of the scraper and uh, they were designed to be blown up and they would be blown up regularly and the troop that was inside would survive because it was designed for maximum survivability while well, the only people that were ever killed inside huskies were killed by EFPs and it was because of the way the EFP was set in I'm not going to give you the details on that but uh, I'm also aware that at least one or two buffaloes were also breached by EFPs. I do not believe anyone was killed. I had not heard of that happening yet, but I have heard at least one or two buffaloes were breached by EFPs. So, these things really showed a uh, sophistication in an IED cell. Before this, about all you've seen was maybe artillery projectiles, mortars, bulk explosives with some shrapnel. Maybe you'd see a uh, shape charge getting set in on the side of the road once in a while. But that stuff, you know, that's really base level when you think about it in the ingenuity going into those. This took it that step beyond, okay? This showed a lot of intelligence inside an IED cell. You found EFPs in the area. You knew you were dealing with a uh, bomb maker who knew what the hell they were doing. And when you started coming across one that was putting in EFPs with the PIR sensors, that showed you had not just a expert bomb maker in the area, you were also dealing with a cell that was well funded, well supplied. So those of you that were, you know, are using this for educational purposes and that stuff for reenacting and everything, here you go. Hopefully I explained it a little bit. Uh, this was a game changer in Iraq. The EFP was. That, that took IEDs to a whole new level. So. And it wasn't too long after EFPs came out, just a few years, is, is when the uh, coalition pulled out of Iraq. I'm not going to say there was a cause and effect on this, but EFPs caused a considerable amount of casualties. You know, there had been a lot of casualties due to IEDs before this, but as soon as the EFPs came in there, you know, it the casualties from IEDs just got more more horrendous, more graphic. The, the kills by the IEDs were started uh, increasing. So, but hopefully this, uh, for those of you trying to find out the information as to what an EFP was, how it was used and that stuff, now you know. Uh, these were designed as an anti-armor type weapon, anti-vehicle type weapon. Could or was it used against troops in the open? I suspect it was, but really it would be a waste of that asset. You know, you would be better off going off with a uh, artillery shell going off next to troops than you would an EFP. So. Now for all my engineer brothers in the Patriot and Militia movements, always remember, SA Ons.